Yeah, experiments in the quantum disco. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, it's been fun. Let's do it again. And thanks for being here at the last session. So I'll give an overview of experiments that we um, are, in, are in the process of doing, some preliminary results, some future ambitions, and let's see what it's like. Right, so I'm um, featuring a bunch of people um, from our team contributed in uh, one or other way from either being experimentalists or um, NLP people or software developers or uh, group leaders and of course the noisy quantum computers that we all love and want to use um, so many thanks to these people and those that build the computers so um, we saw a slide like this before uh, it's the reason we all want to understand and reason about language. Uh, the quote is that it's AI hard in the sense that if you can understand it and manipulate it and simulate manipulating it, then you've done something non-trivial. And of course, application-wise, I've highlighted a big number of dollars here, 130 billion projected by the end of the decade, so big market, a lot of applications, people have problems they want to solve involving a large uh, amount of text in many different application areas. And that's partly also why we are interested, of course. The state of the art, as we all know, and we saw interesting talks about it today, involve big, uh, big language models involving deep neural networks. State of the art is transformer-like things where everything is composed of small little things called artificial neurons. They're basically doing linear operations followed by non-linearities, um, inspired by the biological components of the brain. I've quoted here the number of parameters that uh, a cortex, the cerebral cortex, is supposed to have, 125 trillion synapses. The large language models are close to that. So the philosophy here is scale up. It will probably become smart. And that's not unlikely. Um, but there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of literature saying scaling up is not enough. So while you're scaling up and waiting for the thing to become smart, maybe you should also try to be more of a reductionist scientist, but in a holistic way. So it's kind of a paradox. And we kind of, the model we pick to mo model through this paradox is DiscoCat, um, which, uh, as we all know, was introduced by three of the people that are here today, Steve, Bob, and Mernouche. DiscoCat tries to combine structure and distributional semantics. So structure comes from linguistics, Chomsky, Lambic, people like that, who look at language in a very formal sense. So Chomsky has this... Uh, famous sentence, coreless green ideas sleep furiously, which he says doesn't mean anything, as Dusko was saying before, but actually does mean something. Um, the point he's making, this guy here, is that it doesn't mean anything because it's low probability. Like, no one ever says it, so it doesn't mean anything. So there, if you start thinking about probabilities and, and meaning from use and context, then you have to think about distributional semantics. And everyone quotes Firth, and I'm quoting him as well. And the quote is, um, the meaning of a word is the company it keeps. So then how do you model this stuff? Will you use vector spaces like Dominic was talking about today? And so this cut combined the two, right? You see the structure, you say, how do I stick vectors in structures like this? Well, um, this cut will tell you how, and this cut was inspired by categorical quantum mechanics um, because that's what Bo was doing in Oxford. So uh, why categorical? So category theory allows you to draw analogies between things that don't seem related. If you abstract enough, you know how to go up to the clouds and then come back to another domain. So what is category theory? It talks about a bunch of objects connected to a uh, with a bunch of arrows. So I have things and ways with which they transform. People talk about this in the conference. And we have functors. And functors map a category to another category in a way that preserves structures. So you map objects to objects and arrows to arrows. So if you kind of understand this category, through a functor, you can transfer your knowledge to the other domain. So that's what we will use today. Basically going to be defining a bunch of functors and then using them. 
parameterized functors, as Alexis likes to say in DiscoPy. Um, so, um, specifically the categories I'll be talking about are process theories, and they are uh, basically described with diagrams, monoidal diagrams, because process theories are monoidal category theories. And I'll, um, well, most of you might know what this means, but monoidal just means, well, I'll show you what it means, but okay. So these diagrams are all composed out of boxes and wires. So wires are typed and uh, boxes are transformations. So if you see it categorically, the types uh, carried by the arrows are the objects and the boxes that transform transform them are the arrows. So this is the specific type of categories that we will have in mind as a high level template to instantiate models in and, and, and play around. So specific boxes that are useful are states, effects. Uh, so states are like inputs. So they, 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 they don't have input themselves. They only output stuff. Effects are the upside down of it. So they only have input and they, they kill any output. Uh, scalars are things that don't have open wires, like results. And identity wire, is, it's basically a box which doesn't do anything, right? It's, it's the nothing box. Uh, it's just a wire. So all of these things, um, they have specific rewrites. We have specific, specific states that are cups and cups, and they're just bent wires. They satisfy the snake, so you can, it doesn't matter how uh, the shape of the wire, basically, you can wiggle it around, and you can bend states to effects by transpositions. And all of these allow you to play around with these diagrams. Now, the, the big point is that you can compose them, right? Um, so compositionality is the, is the big point here. Uh, if you compose a bunch of boxes, either parallel or sequential, as long as you uh, respect the type matching, like the types of the, the output types of one uh, box have to match the input types of the next box that you compose with, then you can compose whatever you like. Anything legal is uh, permitted, so that's called free composition. And this is the framework we're talking about. These are called process theories in a very, very uh, flash, flash course. So um, now we went to the clouds. We come back from the clouds and we land on the, the land of grammar. And what is grammar in linguistics? Basically, we view the meaning or um, the type of a sentence as composed as a whole from its part in a non-trivial way, right? Now the composition here in process theories is basically described by a bunch of words being states. All the diagrams are read are read from bottom from top to bottom. I have words inputting, I have a big process called grammar, and I have the whole the meaning of the whole outputting. This is the big idea. Um, specific grammars that we will use are uh, pregroups. We've uh, heard about them. The specific objects or types of this category are these grammatical types. The compositions are specifically cups. So all grammatical reductions are just patterns of cups that uh, connect the types according to the rules of the grammar. And then the output is just a sentence type. So another type of grammar that, uh, that we, we like to work with are combinatorial, uh, uh, wait, what's, what's the name of it? Categorial combinatory grammar, right? CCGs. And again, we have words, they have types, and there's composition rules that are the boxes or the arrows. The types are the objects of this category. And then uh, this process here uh, describes the, the reduction, the, the grammatical reduction of the whole sentence. Basically, the point of this slide is that any linguistic, um, um, any, any, any reduction in a type-based uh, grammar is a process in a process theory um, of these objects and boxes, where objects are the types and boxes are the deductions, right? It's kind of trivial, but um, it's going to be useful when I want to define functors. Um, and of course, there are rewrite rules. Uh, rewrite rules are rewrites, diagram manipulations that respect semantics. Um, for example, if you have like, um, well, no, I'm not going to go into examples. It's obvious. This diagram has the same meaning as this diagram. This diagram has the same meaning as that diagram because um, there might be um, ambiguity. There might be many reductions, might be some freedom, some redundancy in the rules that allow you from the same input to reach the same output, and it doesn't matter how you get there. So you want to say, I'm going to say equal uh, between every 
way to get there. That's basically what it says. And how do I transform from one way to get there to another way to get there? There are rewrite rules. Um, quantum theory is also a process theory. Um, the types are Hilbert spaces. The boxes are spiders. ZX calculus tells you, here's a set of rewrite rules that uh, as long as you use only them, I've animated those. Uh, they're ba ba basically a bunch of equations that tell you as long as you transform your diagrams according to these rewrite rules, then you don't violate the semantics, right? So in the same way that I didn't violate the semantics of these sentences when I rewrote them. So uh, language is a process theory, quantum theory is a process theory. They're both process theories. Can I define a functor between them? Let's do that. Let's map types to Hilbert spaces and type reductions to quantum processes. Um, we saw talks where uh, people have used this, uh, inspired by our papers. And basically what has been going, in this, uh, has been going on is this, right? Uh, we take uh, states that are word states, and we map them to quantum states, which are prepared by parameterized circuits. Why parameterized circuits? Because I want some freedom. And this, these parameters on this unitary, represented by a circuit, prepares a state from a fixed reference state, which is the all zero state. It could be any product state, but Let's fix all zeros. The point here is that this is preparing a parameterized quantum state. Uh, the deeper the circuit, the more complicated the state. But um, uh, due to uh, wanting to be a quantum engineer about it, then you have to care um, how deep is your circuit, how complicated it is, because if it's too expressive, then you will have problems. But this is the high level idea. You want this to be parameterized because you want to do some learning later from actual data. You want to train it from from text, so you, you leave some upper parameters. So that's the idea about states. Um, and for training it, well, basically, you want to say, OK, how do I take the similarity? How do I do word similarity? Let's, let's take overlap of two states. Morally, it's that, mathematically. In practice, how do you do it? Well, you can try to simulate the whole thing. Um, uh, it's going to be ex exponentially expensive, naively unless your circuits have very specific structures, but let's, let's, let's say it's exponentially hard with the width of the circuit and the width of the circuit, of course. What? The width and the depth, I mean. Um, but there's, like, uh, there's, there's things that you can try to, to cheat around. So you could say, I'm going to do a swap test and, and just outsource all of my exponential cost here in the additive error of measuring that control qubit. I could do quantum kernel estimation and see the frequency of all zeros coming out instead of actually doing that. I could, um, I could uh, use the fact that the all zeros state is the only state that maximizes the sum of uh, expectation value of Z operators. So I could say, let's maximize that and train the parameters so that um, I approximate this quantity. The point is that um, this is word similarity. Overlap of two states, each of which are present, um, prepared um, by quantum circuits, which are parameters, um, overlap is that, right? The amplitude with a Born rule makes it nonlinear, so it's kind of more interesting, and you can train it from data. So, for example, you can take these overlaps, you can st stick them through a glove or word to vec cost function and train it. And we saw some work today that, um, that does this with density matrices on, on small scale data, and that's also what we are um, doing because we want to use these states for, for tasks, downstream tasks that, that involve uh, whole sentences. These words need to get into some sentences. Now, um, right, so this slide is about, uh, instead, of, instead of caring about pairs of words, so let's say my vocabulary is size V, if, uh, if I want to train pairs of words, I need to quadratically many times call the quantum computer to get every um, overlap, but I can be smart about it. I can say, well, let's, let's gather some measurements um, inspired by this work by Huang, uh, classical shadow stuff, where uh, you take some measurements, you store them, and then you, with classical post-processing and accessing the quantum computer linearly many times in the size of the vocabulary, we can get the overlaps approximately with some errors, of course, but uh, we can, we can live with the trade-offs if you want to access the quantum computer linearly many times instead of quadratically. And since we, we have, okay, we have talked about words and, and how we can load the data in with some training, 
Um, now we have to worry about the grammatical reductions. And I mentioned that the grammatical reductions become quantum processes. So in the pre-group model uh, that um, everyone has been using um, in the disco cut context, when, uh, when we want to do quantum NLP, the cups are mapped to Bell effects, right? Like, the, like Kevin just uh, um, said in his talk, you, you need to post-select, right? You, you, the cup is a, a deterministic, a non-deterministic effect. So you do, you do measurements, you do joint measurements on, on two qubits or two quantum systems, and you only keep the outcomes that are perfectly correlated. And that's, you know, when you realize the cup. In the CCG reductions model, where you have boxes that are two to one, we choose to map them to channels that look like this. So we have two systems coming in, quantum systems, defined on some number of qubits each, and then one system coming out and the other one getting discarded. So basically, in, operationally, what you do here is you just ignore that qubit, you put it in the trash, and then, then this system only continues. So what does this look like um, for the example where I have only one qubit per wire? So the size of the Hilbert spaces I've chosen to, my, my, to, type, to map my types, my grammatical types to are 2D. Um, so a disco cut diagram becomes like this. We've seen many pictures like that. These are post selections. Um, any, any computation that doesn't output plus state and zero state, you throw in the bin. And this has exponential cost if, you, if you're not smart about reshaping, but still it's exponential cost asymptotically in the width of the sentence. Um, if you use trees like uh, we are doing now, um, with discards, operationally, they don't have much cost. Of course, they have more cost to simulate them because you need to simulate a partial trace, but this is a detail. I said we, we, we are putting uh, circuits in these boxes, right? I didn't say what circuits. Uh, these are the ANZETSE that some people mentioned in some talks. So you, you pick something that is expressive. Um, there's a lot of QML literature on what the best ANZETSE are um, for generic tasks. Um, so here for a specific word, we, we don't know, I mean, I personally don't know the micro NLP that allows me to choose an ansatz for a word. So we just choose something that is expressive enough. So an IQP ansatz is uh, something we've been using a lot. Um, just alternating layers of Hadamard and, and controlled uh, Z rotations. And another ansatz we've been using is uh, layers of RYs and control RX rotations or variations of that, it doesn't really matter. You just want to pick something expressive and work with it. So these anzetze then are getting stuck in these boxes and that's how the functor works. So you put on your quantum engineer hat and you say, now I have these grammatical reductions. Let's, let's, uh, let's see what kind of variations we can make, what types of species of functors I can create to, to, to define different types of quantum tree species, okay? So let's take this tree here. This is kind of complica complicated. So uh, shrooms made Alice feel small. Um, one choice you can make is, as we said in, uh, before, every word has its own circuit in the sense that everything has a, the same ansatz but different parameter sets. So the parameter set theta sh uh, parameterizes the quantum state for shrooms. Uh, um, uh, theta A parameterizes um, the Alice state and so on. Now these boxes, I can choose them to all be the same. The same box and I can reuse it. Like the same coarse grainer of information, quantum information gets reused. Let's call this unibox. Um, or we can say, oh, it depends on the CCG rule, if it's forward application or backward application. So I have two types of boxes. Or I can say, I, oh, let it depend on like the distance from the leaves, from the trees. So like it's height based. So every renormalization uh, scale has a different coarse grainer. So every box has to renormalize or filter out different scales of information in the sentence. And you can play around like it's, it's a big playground. So when, once you define one of these models, um, you pick a task and w then you were a quantum computational linguist, you became a quantum NLP guy or girl or person. Um, and you do a binary classification task, okay? Um, we've all been classifying sentences. This is again uh, another example of this. Um, for example, if every wire is one qubit, trivial thing, and every one of these boxes is a 
two qubit box, these, these coarse grainers here, you measure this qubit and with some probability if you gather enough sample it's going to be zero or one and that's like the, the label of your class for that sentence. So um, what we've done here is basically define a syntactic quantum uh, convolutional neural network as the Kong paper likes to call them, um, QCNNs or um, we can call them quantum recursive neural networks. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's, it's basically a uh, parameterized quantum circuit that represents, that is informed by the syntactic structure of the sentence. So it's problem specific, the structure is problem informed and problem specific, and we use it for something practical. And um, an another, another thing that I like about trees is that uh, there is work from the QML literature again that says that um, you don't have barren plateau problems when you try to train one of these things. Now, I don't know what happens when you want to train multiple, uh, um, like a whole forest of these trees, because that's what we have to do here, but um, it's something we're looking into. And why do I say forest? Because I don't only want to train one sentence. I have a bunch of sentences in a data set. That's what, how supervised learning works, right? Classification. A bunch of sentences, they all have its, uh, their own labels. And I have a test set and a train set. And the, the, the job of the training phase is to, to get the trees, to get the boxes, and, the, and the, um, to get all the circuits to learn to, to train the parameters so that the correct labels are measured with high probability, right? And then you put in a new sentence from the text, a test set, and then you see uh, what label comes out, and that, that's the prediction phase, and you, you, you see your prediction error. Um, and this is stuff we've, we've done before with a quantum pregroup model. We have the cups, and now we're doing it with trees. And again, the goal is to use both IBM and our Honeywell-powered um, continuum owned quantum computers and um, use one or the other device depending on what, uh, what the pros and cons are. For example, ion traps are slow but very high fidelity and so and, and superconducting based devices are very fast but much noisier. So you might want to use one for training and the other one for testing, stuff like that. So we're, we're also looking into these ideas. Um, so here is a Oh, very funky. What's going on? Okay, here's an example of, of some uh, training on a very trivial data set that we used also in the paper uh, called QNLP in practice, where in that, in that paper we used the pregroup model. Here we used trees. In the unibox, the most trivial case, um, the ansatz was ansatz 14 with one layer. Every wire was one qubit, if I recall correctly. Um, so that's the top row. And, it kind of trains, it works. The data set is, is, is very simple. It's the same data set as the first uh, of this paper, as I said. So you have simple, very simple sentences that correspond to food or IT. Then if you try the height-based model, for example, or the rule-based, they're a bit more complicated ones, so you have more parameters to fit. Um, then they work better, as expected, intuitively. And then a more complicated thing that is um, involving real data, not just toy data uh, like we've, we've been trying so far. Um, preliminary results, not so impressive, but that's still, it's encouraging. Uh, we still need to push it more. Three qubits per wire, two layer IQP and Z per box, uh, real data from messy sentences. The screen is cutting off a bit, so I'm gonna read like a sentence. A masterful film from a master filmmaker, unique in its deceptive grimness, compelling in its fatalist worldview, so it's like complicated stuff. It's movie reviews from uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Um, the training set was 216 sentences, which factors to 666 to, you'll like that. Um, 35 training sentences. So kind of works, we're pushing this. This is, by the way, training all the words in task, so not using word embeddings yet, because they don't look very nice so far, but working on training, training them as well. Uh, a lot of software engineering has happened, which has contributed to Lambic, so we're very happy about that as well. So everything is coming together, and this, this should be a shunis. Um, another thing we're working uh, towards is uh, getting messier with transformers. So like, I'm, I'm, I have a high-level dial here, which is here I replace from the classical transformer little components with PQCs, and here the ambition is to have them all fully 
coherent versions of transformers. So here shown is helping us going high in the clouds with category theory and then coming back. And then Doug is helping us um, to, to, to replace components of the, of the circuits. By the way, I wanted to say this is work by uh, Karis Harvey over there. And thank, thank you to all of the developers from, Lam from the Lambeck team who helped with both of these projects. Um, very, very quickly, I'm going to talk about Disco CERC. Um, so, I've been talking about sentences, sentence by sentence. All the sentences are not connected coherently. So, they are connected just by the fact that a word may appear in more than one sentence. So, they're correlated classically, even if every sentence has quantum correlations in it, and then you measure in, you, you make use of QML arguments like, oh, it has quantum interference and entanglement, superposition, but that's all in a sentence. Um, the DiscoCert project started by Bob as well uh, in the paper called uh, Mathematics of Text Structure. The idea here is um, how do you connect sentences together? Um, so again, you, you put on your uh, process theory hat on and you say, I'm going to connect sentences together by saying nouns are first class citizens. They go through a text, they get modified by stuff. Stuff happens to them. This stuff is adjectives, verbs, adverbs. Vincent can tell you about this stuff. He's worked on this uh, at the theory level. Um, so a language like this, uh, sorry, um, a text like this. Humans understand language. Humans quickly build robots. So robots generate language. You see there's like copies of, of the same noun appearing. So I have the nouns coming in, and you have to connect the wires such that um, uh, the gates, the verbs, the adjectives, and so on, they act on them. And also we have higher order stuff like adverbs that act on adjectives. So we have modifiers of modifiers and you can go higher order as much as you like, process theoretically, but of course, linguistically, you won't, have, you won't go too much higher order, right? I mean, there must be a cutoff. Humans don't, humans cannot deal with like infinite dimensional. Maybe you can, I don't know. Right? Okay, so of course, since we, we like quantum models, um, well, we can think, how do we map stuff like that to quantum circuits? Well, again, we define a functor. Um, so, uh, by the way, these things have been automated recently by Ricci and company. Um, so you can, you can directly go from text to circuit. So here's an example uh, of a text, so two sentences. Uh, here's a, an example of three or four sentences. It gets complicated, very nice. This is all automatic. It's all in um, disco pi representation. And uh, this is how I define a functor to quantum stuff. So, of course, states become states, as I said before. Boxes become quantum circuits, unitaries. And combs, higher order stuff, become higher order uh, quantum processes by adding ancilla. So this is to be read downwards. So like, I have two systems, I need an ancilla system, and then I trace it out, but it's, it did its job to modify a box. The idea of a comb is that I put a box here that has both input and output, and I get a box back. And that way it's higher order, right? So you could have higher and higher order stuff, but let's stick with this for now. Um, so with these kinds of diagrams, if you stick them together, you get something that looks like a big text circuit. So as I did before, I want the overlap of two words to be able to train them like word to vec style. Here's the overlap of a state like we had before, two states like we had, we had before. This is how you take overlaps of two processes like Martha was doing, um, like Martha showed us this morning. This is basically trace u1, u2 dagger, right? There's a trace of two things in a row. And the higher order stuff, again, you generalize the trace. This is how I plan to do it. You just join all the dagger wires together and you get higher order traces. And through the functor, it would look something like this. Now, of course, there is some post selection involved or here. There's a maximally mixed state preparation here. Um, one of them has a cost classically, the other one has a cost quantumly, as in if you simulate it or do it operational on a quantum device. But the point is that you pay this upfront cost. The scaling parameter is not the width of the circuit. The scaling parameter here, cool. The scaling parameter here is the, big, uh, the size of the text, right? So once you've trained all of these things and string them together to a, through a big text circuit, you get a big quantum circuit. And then you can say, I have a model that satisfies specific desiderata of compositionality, it's quantum, it goes through a linguistic functor, and so on. 
And under all of these desiderata, I have created a model that, uh, for which I can think what tasks can it do. And for these tasks, you would need a quantum computer. So maybe I don't have time to go through all of these tasks because also we haven't tried them yet, but here are some ideas like, say you want to compare two circuits, if they're talking about the same thing and involve the same nouns, but also the, they, they talk about the story differently, right? So generalization of overlap of two states is overlap of two text states, right? Uh, nouns go in, they go through one text, they go through the other text backwards, does the all zero state come out? I don't know, gather frequency of zeros and check, or do a swap test, or do something clever. So we want to think about things like that. Or um, maybe you want to do something local. Maybe you want to measure only one actor, because as the text scales, um, you can still do a local measurement and, and get some sort of claim, some sort of advantage given that model, given that specific model, advantage over simulating that model. So we're thinking of things like that as well. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to close by saying uh, we're hiring. Check out this uh, link. Come train some quantum robots. Thanks. Thank you.